professor of political science here at OSU, and it is my pleasure to moderate the U.S. Senate debate. Uh, this has been a joint effort between the League of Women Voters of Oklahoma and Oklahoma State University. And let's introduce the candidates. Democratic State Senator Connie Johnson and Republican U.S. Representative James Lankford. is a very long job interview, and as such, we will be approaching this debate as an interview. Uh, we have selected a series of questions uh, dealing with the most salient issues of our time, and we'll get to hear where the candidates stand on those key points. Uh, the debate is, and the format of this debate is going to be that each candidate will have two minutes for an opening remark, two minutes for a closing statement, and each question, they will have 90 seconds to answer the questions. All of the questions in my section of the question process were selected by me and me alone. However, we will be taking some questions from the students in the audience. In fact, we have ushers walking through the audience right now distributing pieces of paper for students to write down their questions. We ask that they write their name and the year that they are here at OSU. We have a panel uh, that will review those questions, a representative from the College Republicans, a representative from the College Democrats, and a representative from the League of Women Voters will review those questions and give me the top three. We'll ask those questions at the end of the debate. And with that, let's start with our opening statements. So, based on the coin toss, State Senator Connie Johnson, you will be going last, and uh, U.S. Representative James Langford, you will start with your opening statements. You have two minutes. Thank you. It is absolutely my honor to be able to be here in this conversation, both the folks that are watching online and the folks that are here in this room. It is a privilege for the two of us to be able to stand here. And we understand that we carry a responsibility both to our state and to the nation to be a represent as well. 22 years I served in ministry, working with families, mostly with middle school, high school, and college age students. It was absolutely my joy to be able to do that. We have tremendous need in our families. Four years ago, my wife and I sent the call to be able to serve in the United States House of Representatives. To us, this is still serving families. This is still doing what we have always done try to do what we can with our family and with our time and effort to be able to make the best difference that we can, both for God and for our state and for our families and our community. Now, I have to tell you, four years ago, walking into the House of Representatives, it was more like walking back on campus at a middle school cafeteria lunch. Because on middle school lunch, it prides itself on trying to insult each other, and run each other down, and say crazy weird things. And as I walked into Congress, I thought, that's exactly what this is. It's a big middle school lunch room. So trying to reset a tone and reset an example of how we pay respect to each other, even when we disagree, how to be able to set out parameters and say, this is the thing that we consider best for the nation. How do we actually get those things accomplished? And it moves from complaining and talking about issues to actually solving issues. We have tremendous debt as a nation. We have all kinds of educational issues as a nation. We have all kinds of opportunities that are not being won out for the youngest generation as they come up. We want everyone to be able to have those great opportunities. We have income inequality. We have a lot of issues that we have to deal with as a nation. It is essential to us that we actually take those things seriously and to be able to work together to find real results. And I have to tell you, I strongly believe conservative solutions do win out. That those options and those ideas win in every neighborhood, in every community, in every town, in our state, and across America. If we will actually honor each other as we walk through the process. So I look forward to the conversation tonight and uh, to be able to talk through all these issues. Thank you. State Senator Johnson, you have two minutes. Thank you, Professor Lamar, and good evening, everyone. It is my honor and blessed privilege to be here this evening and to present my feelings, my thoughts, my views, but more so to see how those issues resonate with you as voters in the state of Oklahoma. Congressman Langford is correct. It is time for us to have the conversations about economic equality, about fairness in our economic system, about taxes, about health care, about women's reproductive freedom, and certainly about privatization of Social Security and what that means for the future well-being of the majority of Oklahoma citizens who, like me, are baby boomers now. It's a time for us to have a conversation that is devoid of labels about conservatives or liberals or Republicans or Democrats. It's time for us to talk about the people of Oklahoma 
and what issues concern them, what issues government should be addressing, and what issues you should be addressing as individuals. My campaign has been a campaign for the people. As I've traveled the state of Oklahoma, I've heard you talk about the need to strengthen public education, the need to create jobs that are meaningful, that pay a living wage, not just a minimum wage, and perhaps through in increasing our infrastructure. But I've mostly heard you talk about the need for the government to get out of our business, to let people live their lives, and to let people make choices as individuals that the government shouldn't have anything to do with. I come to you tonight with 33 years of experience in the Oklahoma State Senate, having actually resolved problems of citizens, written policies that made a difference in their lives, and now I'm asking for your vote for me for the U.S. Senate to go and do the same thing in, in Washington, D.C. I'm happy that you're here tonight, and I look forward to these conversations. All right. Thank you. And I did forget to mention in the opening statements that we do ask audience members to hold all of their applause until the end of the debate. Uh, that way we can focus our attention on their answers and their answers alone. Thank you very much. So it's time now for the questions. This first question will go to you, Congressman Lankford. Um, I set it up with the uh, introduction that a campaign is a, a long job interview. And in that sense, why don't we talk about campaign finance reform? Uh, not many people would apply for a job if the application fee was more than 10 times the salary of the job. Uh, and yet, this is what takes place when members of Congress run for public office. Do you think the amount of money spent on campaigns is a problem, and do you support a constitutional amendment to curtail it? Thanks for asking, and no, I would not support a constitutional amendment to curtail it. You're actually, step, what's interesting is the First Amendment was set up to protect political speech. The last thing the founders wanted to have is a king or anyone else stepping in and telling everyone how to, how to talk about things, what they could talk about, what they couldn't talk about, who could get a voice, who doesn't. We have students right now protesting in Hong Kong because the leadership in China is stepping in and saying, we have a few changes we're going to make in election law, and we're going to help select a group of leaders, and we're going to try to alter some of the system. We should allow the free conversation that's happening. Now, saying all that, I can assure you, it's a great frustration to be able to walk through the campaign finance issues, to make sure you do everything correctly, make sure you file every form, walk through every process, but it's completely appropriate to have the transparency that's needed through that process. Uh, as many people would know, and people that are watching this, if you're going to have a commercial on television, that does cost money. They don't do that for free. If you're going to have a sign in a yard, that does cost money. A piece of mail to send to someone's house or uh, to be able to put uh, some, something around on, some, on the back of their car with a sticker on it. The fundraising that happens doesn't go to the candidates. It actually goes to help get the message out from the campaign. And when I go to someone and say, I'd like to have your help to be able to get the message out, they can make a decision on who they believe in and what they're going to do. So transparency is extremely important. We have that. People can look online and they can see every donor of every possibility uh, out there in the race, and I think that's entirely appropriate. But I do not like the thought of silencing political speech. Thank you. Senator? Thank you. If, in fact, the cost of running a campaign is 10 times the cost or 10 times the amount of the salary that I would expect to receive, I'm on minimum wage. We are a grassroots campaign. Votes are the only things that trump dollars. We have enjoyed traveling the state in my car, using gasoline, paying food for my helpers, paying for food. But I believe that, that the cost of a campaign should not outweigh the value of the campaign. And what we have today with uh, decisions like Citizens United, where untold amounts of cash are being funneled into campaigns by private corporations uh, in ways that influence policymakers to make decisions that are not always in the best interest of the people. I think those are the concerns that we're really speaking to when we're talking about campaign finance and the need for campaign finance reform. We know that that, that uh, court hearing, that uh, decision has been upheld, but we know that it doesn't leave us in any better place when it comes to how we fund our campaigns and how we get our message out to people. I appreciate this opportunity to have to talk to the students of Oklahoma State University and those who are watching us online. This is one of the free opportunities, and I'm very appreciative for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And State Senator, to this next question, uh, we'll start with you. Uh, it deals with the Islamic State. Uh, with airstrikes taking place in Syria and in Iraq, should Congress vote on an authorization of military action? If so, 
how would you vote? I believe that's a conversation that needs to be had. This ongoing crisis in the Middle East, in fact, the 240 skirmishes that have occurred in the world since World War II are an example, and, and the United States has been involved in all of them. Those are examples of wars that are basically founded and, and based in religious issues. And we keep trying to put a political and a military solution on a religious situation. And we can see that it continues and it's not been very successful. I would de definitely take a long, hard look at whether we send our troops into harm's way again, again into situations that we've not been able to resolve because of the nature of those situations. I think that vote has been taken, and I think Mr. Langford voted in support of it. I think there are some, some alternatives, though. I think the United States looks, needs to look more at peaceful resolutions and get our house in order in terms of how we're spending money for uh, things overseas versus how we're spending money on our soldiers when they come home. This is the big challenge for me in sending people to war. We have to be prepared for when they come back or we don't need to get into those wars in the first place. Thank you. Congressman? Yeah, the Islamic State is not under the previous authorization for the uh, use of military force. In 2001, Congress voted to approve uh, execution of military force for those directly connected to the September 11, 2001 uh, attacks. The president now is saying that he still has authorization to move into Syria based on that authorization from Al-Qaeda and for those directly connected to September uh, 11, 2001. He doesn't. That, that is not an accurate use of military force. And the 2002 authorization for the use of military force was directly connected to Iraq. He is moving forces into this. Now, the issue is this is something that Congress has to resolve. This is the way our system was set up. Federalist Paper 69 is very specific. And as you go back to the Federalist Papers, you'll be able to determine all these different amendments and all this different language, where did it come from? Federalist 69 is a really good one to be able to look at. It defines out the power and shows how different war power is from the previous King of England. So the King of England could actually call up his army and then go execute the army and go work out and be able to have the war. Said so the President of the United States won't have that same authority. The President of the United States can't just call up the army and then be commander in chief. He is commander in chief after Congress has approved that. The reason that was put in there was specifically so the American people, we would be engaged in that conversation. When we feel threatened, when we understand that there's a real threat, then the American people, through their elected representatives, would say to the president, it's time for us to engage. We're willing to put our sons and daughters at risk. So yes, the president absolutely should come back to Congress for that. That debate needs to happen. I've already spoke on that on the House floor. Good. Well, thank you. Congressman, uh, this next question deals with Ebola. Uh, it's kind of in our backyard. Texas Governor Rick Perry is calling on federal officials to implement screening procedures at all U.S. points of entry. Screeners would take the temperature of travelers and conduct other assessments to determine their overall health. If elected to the Senate, would you support those moves? Yeah, we already have procedures in place, and the President is actually doing a decent job of trying to do some changes in that, in that process. What needs to happen right now is we need to verify everyone coming from West Africa. And we need to determine, did they have contact and not just assume, right now we're asking the question, did you have contact with someone with Ebola? Sometimes they know, sometimes they don't. The gentleman in Texas that's right now struggling for his life, he was fully aware that he had contact with someone from Ebola and he lied on his form coming through. So the, the first check needs to be not just, hey, tell us the truth. It needs to be verifying every individual that comes from that region. We talk about one person in the United States right now that's struggling with Ebola. That's a dramatic thing for us. But realize right now in West Africa, Around 7,500 people right now have Ebola, and their system is completely overwhelmed. CDC estimates by the time we get to January of this year, there may be as many as half a million. I understand that there are people halfway across the world that are in real desperate need of engagement. This disease will spread if the United States doesn't engage. There's no other place in the world that's better equipped than we are to deal with this disease. And it would be wrong for us as a nation to back up and say we're going to just allow half a million people to die in West Africa because we don't want to engage because we're afraid. We should lean in to be able to help. We are equipped to do that. But we should also pay attention to ports of entry to make sure that we're verifying when people come from that district, we are doing some basic screening. Thank you. State Senator? I believe this is, in fact, the most dire world health issue of our time. 
And it, it was just a matter of time before it came to America. But I, and I agree with the congressman that uh, the majority of these cases are centered in West Africa. But with our highly mobile society of today, people travel from Africa to Chinese, to China, to Japan, to New England. And those areas are just as likely and just as capable of exposure as any other place in the world. I think a comprehensive system for our ports would cover anyone who comes from overseas. I think the method of screening is, is non-invasive. I think that everybody who would get screened, similar to how we're screened to now uh, to go through the airports, I don't think anyone would consider it a hassle. I think it is something that we all, as citizens of the world, have to be committed to. And until we can get this virus under control, I don't think any measure is too extreme. extreme. Screening in and of itself is not a difficult process. It is one that is available. It is one that can be instituted immediately. And I think it's one that uh, people don't mind having to go through. Thank you. And this question, we will start with you as well, State Senator. Uh, marriage equality. This debate is coming on the heels of the Supreme Court decision to reject lower court appeals overturning the ban of same-sex marriage in five states, including Oklahoma. There are still more than 20 states, however, that, that ban same-sex marriage. Now, if my wife and I moved to a state uh, that, another state, we would, our marriage would be recognized. However, if a same-sex couple moves to a state that doesn't recognize same-sex marriage, they will not be considered married. Uh, should Congress step in and make same-sex marriage legal in all 50 states, or should we leave this to the states? And I'm very pleased that, that this debate comes on the heels of that no decision. I was celebrating yesterday with my friends in Oklahoma who are of different gender orientation. I understand their challenges. I understand them as humans, though, first and foremost. And how are we to treat human beings differently from the way we would like to be treated? This whole question of same-sex marriage uh, was voted on in Oklahoma 10 years ago. And since that time, our demographic, dem demographics have changed substantially to the extent that I think people who choose to do and, and are differently oriented in their gender, they have the same rights as those of us who are, are oriented the way we are. I don't think there should be an opportunity for states to decide. I think that just like interstate commerce, we ought to be able to have that uh, freedom to go from state to state and people be able to keep their values, their principles, their lifestyles intact without government, unnecessary governmental interference. I believe that uh, if the United States were to take on that issue, I think it would be a, a useful discussion for us to have in Congress. Because again, at the state level, we see we only have five states so far. But I think that that attitude is changing as we go up, as our state as our states grow older, as our nation becomes more mature, and I think we have a basic duty to respect humanity. Thank you very much, Congressman Langford. Every person is created in the image of God. Every person, every person has value and worth. But the United States Constitution clearly leaves that authority to make decisions for marriage to the states. And I would say it's clearly because it's clear from the Tenth Amendment that all things not addressed in the Constitution are reserved to the states. Now, it's not just my opinion on that. You can go back through 200 years of Supreme Court history, and over and over again, when any issue on marriage came up, the Supreme Court said that is a state issue. That's not a federal government issue. The federal government and Congress should not be engaged in the marriage issue at all. If I go back as recently as last year, the Supreme Court last year in the Defense of Marriage Act uh, hearing that occurred, when their final piece came out, say the federal government can't get involved in this argument, did page after page in their opinion, saying this is a state issue. This is a state issue. States alone can make the, make the decision about marriage and about how to define marriage. And what's interesting was, yesterday, the Supreme Court said, we're not going to hear a case. And basically, their interpretation was either states make the decision or a single federal judge in a state can make that decision. They, they literally conflicted against their own argument from just a year ago in their own opinions. And if you read through the opinions and see what happened yesterday versus what they did last year, it is amazing to me the separation between the two on it. This is uniquely a state issue. 
Now, individuals are to be respected, and there's no question, I've talked about it before, I believe marriage is a traditional marriage between a man and a woman. I think that is the definition of marriage we've had as a nation and that we should maintain. But the states should make the decision on this, not the federal government. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, this, qu this question comes back to you, Congressman. Uh, dealing with veterans, uh, the decision to send U.S. troops into hostile situations can and should be a difficult one. But the debate over how to care for those troops when they return from war, for many, is simple. Serve your country and receive the needed support when you return home. Uh, multiple reports have highlighted deficiencies in veteran services. Do you support increased funding for veteran health care, education, and housing? Yeah, let's start with just the basics on this. What I support is the veteran being able to make a decision where they actually go for health care. Right now, they don't have that capability. It's incredibly frustrating to me. It's something I've talked about for four years, and I'm not alone. Multiple others continue to bring up this same issue. If a veteran is in Woodward, Oklahoma, why do they need to drive to a veteran center to be able to get health care in Oklahoma City or drive to Tulsa or wherever it may be? Why would they need to drive past five or six really good hospitals on the way? Their family has to make that trip. Sometimes they have to leave very early, come get in line at the VA center to be able to go through the process. And so they're leaving out from their home at 3 o'clock in the morning when they're sick already. That's not right. That doesn't treat them with absolute respect. So the first thing that you need to do is not look at just the finance side of it, is to be able to look at the process issues. Allow veterans to choose where they go for health care rather than be forced into certain locations to be able to get health care and health care decisions. This past year, we actually passed a bill to the House of Representatives, Senate over the Senate, and on to the President that gives veterans that first opportunity. Now, what ended up being negotiated with was a 40 mile radius. If you're within 40 miles, that's all we could get. But we took the first step to say we want to allow more opportunities. We hope in the days ahead we can flip the Senate. It's my own personal perspective on that. Uh, to be able to flip the Senate and to be able to open that up to a greater group of people and to be able to say allow veterans to be able to choose. That's an essential part of it. And be able to honor the promise that's been made to those veterans. You can't break that promise. You may change things for a future person signing up, but you don't break the promise to those who have already served our nation. Thank you. State Senator Johnson. Thank you. As a former member of the, the, House, the Senate Veterans Committee in the Oklahoma Legislature, uh, it's, it's usual that we'll have a love fest when it comes to veterans. And so I, I really agree with everything that the Congressman has said um, regarding the need to care for our veterans once they return from war. I think that need goes deeper when we think about what is currently going on with our veterans, not only in the healthcare setting, but in the everyday setting where they are jobless, where they are sometimes incarcerated, where they're homeless, where many of them, record numbers are committing suicide because of PTSD. And we're not listening to our veterans in terms of the help that they say they need, let alone providing the services that they need. As your U.S. Senator, I will fight just as hard for veterans at the U.S. level as I have at the state level. I believe that veterans have given up everything they had they dropped what they were doing, and they went to war to protect our freedoms. At a minimum, when they return home, we need and we deserve to give them the best that they can afford, that we can afford. I was privileged the other day to witness the honor flights coming through the, the airport in Washington, D.C., and we're having a celebration tonight in Oklahoma City to honor those World War II veterans. The pride I saw on their faces for what they gave to our country will never leave my memory. And that is what will drive me and my, my attempts to be of service to them further at the federal level. Thank you. State Senator, uh, arguably one of the most important responsibilities vested with the U.S. Senate is the power to confirm Supreme Court nominees. Would you confirm a Supreme Court nominee who is more politically progressive or, in your case, more conservative uh, than yourself? Put another way, would you vote to confirm a nominee who holds the opposite position you have on issues like abortion, same-sex marriage, or stem cell research? The positions that are appointed by the President, Supreme Court being one, I think are vetted pretty well. Uh, I think with, with uh, President Obama in place right now, I, I don't think I would have to worry about the type of nominee that he would send. The question is whether I would support someone who had different views. If the majority of the committee votes for that, it doesn't matter what I support, but I would definitely continue to be the voice questioning that person about their person's views. As we've seen, uh, we are concerned about the Supreme Court's ruling on marriage equality, but this same Supreme Court struck down uh, Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act. 
So the Supreme Court is potentially all over the place. I think we as senators and representatives of the people have to use our voices to make sure that we vet them in ways that guarantee that we can expect them to perform in their capacities and for them to uphold the laws of the land. The laws of the land, I think, are what will be the ultimate test and the ultimate judge of who gets selected to be a Supreme Court justice. Thank you. Congressman? Yeah, the first test is not my preference. The first test of the United States Constitution. That is a rule. The Supreme Court is a co-equal branch of government. People lose track of that. There's a perspective that the president is the CEO of the government. He kind of gives instructions to folks and everyone kind of carries out that. It's not true. The design of our Constitution is there's an executive branch, there's a legislative branch, and a judicial branch, and all three are co-equal, and all three press on each other. The checks and balances aren't just on one or the other. The checks and balances are there in place so that no one branch can infringe on the individual rights of a person, of us. So it's not just that they compete with each other, it's that they're all watching each other to make sure the power of the individual is protected. So my first litmus test on that would be, do you follow the original intent of the Constitution? As you look at the Constitution and the design that was laid out there, are you following that as a guide, or do you feel like this is a living document that can change the whim of culture? If it changes the whim of culture without amendments, then that's not consistent with the Constitution. There is a way for the Constitution to change. It's through an amendment process. If they would follow a strict construction of the Constitution and they say, I'll follow and be consistent with the law, I could be comfortable with that person. If they're determined to make cultural references or political preferences come off of the bench rather than actually following through the law, then I would absolutely oppose them. Thank you. Well, Congressman, this, this question actually builds on uh, your discussion of the Constitution. Uh, based on the supremacy clause of the Constitution, federal law trumps state law. Currently, there are several states in violation of federal drug enforcement laws regarding marijuana. Should Congress follow the lead of those states and legalize marijuana nationally, or should existing federal law be enforced, thus negating the legalization of marijuana in states like Colorado and Washington? Well, it's an interesting question because this is one of the many areas where the President has spoken to the Justice Department and said, don't enforce federal law. I'm aware that's federal law, but don't enforce that and has used his power of, of a selective prosecution to say I'm going to pick which laws need to be enforced and which laws don't. I think that's a problem. When the president takes the oath of office, he takes the oath of office to honor the Constitution and to protect the laws and to be able to execute faithfully the laws of the land. We have a law in the book. If there is a need to change that law, there needs to be a vote to take it away, not just a president stepping up to say, I'm just not going to enforce the law. I'm going to ignore it like it's not even there. That shouldn't be an option. Now, saying that, as recently as yesterday, the governor of Colorado, Governor Hickenlooper, which has got to be one of the greatest names in all of governors in the, in the nation, <laughs> Governor Hickenlooper yesterday made the statement that he believed that Colorado was reckless when they legalized marijuana. Now, this is the Democrat governor of Colorado. Because of what is happening now in Colorado and what he actually sees and the damage that's doing, he's saying he wished that they would have had more research and more data before they made this decision as a state. So I absolutely do. Part of it is for me, my own perspective, not only constitutionally, but I worked with teenagers for 22 years. I have seen firsthand the damage that's done to families when teenagers get involved in drug use. And as adults start using drugs, it passes on to them. I just have a hard time with anyone saying the best thing we can do for our kids is to get their parents to smoke more marijuana and for that to be legal. I just don't think that's the best thing we can do for our kids. Thank you. State Senator Johnson. Thank you. The question was more so about the federal law trumping the state laws at this point, and the president having issued basically a, a hands-off position about what's going on in Colorado and Washington. As many of you know, I have been the legislator who has promoted reform of our marijuana policies, among other sentencing policies in Oklahoma, because of their unsustainability from an economic perspective. Not only from an economic, but from a medical and a human perspective, and from the perspective of, the, of our economy, our agriculture. Uh, I think it's just as, as, as terrible for a child who is suffering from intractable seizures called epilepsy and Dravet syndrome. I think it's just as bad for us to allow those children to die without having any concern for the fact that we have a natural substance that was created by God that would address those seizures and has been shown to be the only thing 
that addresses those seizures. Those children dying are no different from the children who are dying from violence in the streets because of prohibition that has not worked, that didn't work with alcohol and it's not working with marijuana. But at the end of the day, Oklahoma is a state where cannabis is an indigenous plant and our agricultural community could benefit and make products from, from suntan, from lotions, to paper, to clothing, and those are the issues we should look at and weigh more so than what we're talking about in terms of checking state laws right now. Thank you. Well, State Senator, surveys have shown that the younger generation, and perhaps even some of the students uh, sitting in this audience, uh, think it's more likely they will see a UFO in their lifetime than it is they will ever see a Social Security check. What reforms to Social Security, if any, would you push for? I would push against privatization of Social Security. Social Security is that thing that, yes, we hope our younger generations will be able to benefit and share in what I hope to share in one day. But at this point, there are efforts in Congress and at the national level, along with other areas of our lives, to privatize that system in ways that will put a lot of people women in particular, who have a difficult time getting a job making equal pay for equal work. They will be thrust into poverty if we allow privatization schemes to come in and take over our social security system. So the system, I believe, is working as it is. We should do some things to shore it up. But in no case would I support a change where we would privatize social security. It's just as bad as privatizing education, privatizing other pensions, Privatizing child welfare in Oklahoma. Privatization means profitization, profiteering. And that's what we're seeing. And people deserve to profit over private interest. Social Security is a system that is there. It has been there. It serves people who have worked there all their lives and who are there in their twilight years deserve to have a reasonable income and some security that keeps them from being poor. Thank you. Congressman Langford. I would say, first off, it's probably more likely in Oklahoma they'll see Bigfoot before they see a UFO. Uh, UFOs typically land farther west of us, apparently, so from what, what is written about them. Uh, I, I, the, the big challenge that we have is really making sure Social Security does what it was designed to do. Social Security in its birth was designed to kick in at age 65. At that time, the average life expectancy was between 62 and 65. It was an emergency plan put in place that if someone outlived their own retirement and lived past their life expectancy, that there would be something there as an emergency backup so people didn't end up on the street. It's a compassionate nation that has said, we want to be able to come alongside the disabled. We want to be able to come alongside those that cannot work anymore and have some sort of emergency backup. But it's now risen up to be uh, something that people say, will pay for all of my retirement. And people are slowing down, actually saving for their own retirement. People need to save for their own retirement and make plans, big or small. Some people can only set aside $10 a month. Set it aside. Start a plan for them to be able to get that going and know that Social Security is a backup on it. Now, to say all that, one of the things that we struggle with right now is, uh, I hate to bring his name up, but Harry Reid has said many times publicly, Social Security is not something we need to deal with right now. That doesn't go insolvent for another 20 years. We don't need to deal with it. I adamantly disagree. We do need to deal with it right now. When you look at age, when you look at how the tax is done, when you look at the whole process of Social Security and to be able to evaluate how it's done. If you go back to Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, they made a plan to be able to stabilize Social Security. It is only just now being birthed and being fully implemented. It takes decades to get it going, but you've got to start early. It's very important we do this debate now. Thank you. And Congressman, uh, repealing the Affordable uh, Health Care Act, also known as Obamacare, has been a reoccurring topic in Congress. Instead of discussing why or why not Obamacare should be repealed, let's get to the central topic of the debate. Do you believe quality health care is a right or a privilege in the United States of America? Well, it is both, as strange as that sounds. It is something that's actually given to every individual. If anyone walks into a hospital right now with severe injury, they're given care. Every emergency room in the country does that. Every single entity that takes that. We have backup plans dealing with Medicaid uh, for, the, for those that are in poverty, especially moms and for children to make sure that we're protected. But our system is set up for individuals to be able to engage and to take personal responsibility. For individuals that decide, I'm not going to take personal responsibility for their own life, then there is a tremendous pushback on that. So, okay, what, what are you going to do to be able to step in and to be able to take responsibility for your life? So, each family has responsibility for their own family. 
employers have taken that to be able to push that and say, we're going to provide health care coverage for individuals or employees. But I can tell you the wrong way to do that is to federalize it. Now, I've said it like this with multiple people. I run into very few people that I, I, I meet that say this system's really not working well. And I don't find anyone that, that thinks the healthcare system is working well right now as far as the payment system. So you know what would really make this work better? Let's give it to Washington. Because Washington seems to fix every private problem much better than the private sector did. The problem is not that it's going to get better with Washington, it's gonna get more complicated, more expensive. It, it decreases the amount of access to it. We've seen premiums go up. We've seen folks that are now struggling to be able to find access to the care they want while others are receiving care. There's a better, simpler way to do this. Our community health clinics that both of us have been very engaged with is a better model to be able to help in different areas of poverty. Our Medicaid system in other ways, but not like this, not a takeover of our health care system. Thank you. State Senator Johnson. Whether health care is a right or a privilege is the question. And I agree with Congressman Langford, it is both. However, we have a health care proposal for the first time in 50 years that is actually making a difference in the lives of people who are here for unable not only to afford insurance, but to have access to meaningful and affordable and quality health care. The Affordable Care Act means that people who were not insured before, millions are now insured. The fact that we have a Congress that has continually, 54 times, voted to try to repeal a law that has been passed, that has been upheld, and that has been implemented, says that we're wasting money and we're killing people, and that's the priority. I believe it's more important for us to look at what is going on with our healthcare system when people can't get the care they need, when our systems of government, our systems of care, are overloaded, but people's health care conditions are continuing to decline. I believe Oklahoma is rated like 48th in health care. And that says to me that not only should it be a right, not only should it be a privilege, it should be a necessity. Government exists to provide those things that we can't do individually. Health care. When you have your health, you have everything. When you have your health, you have a better worker. When you have workers who are respected, you don't have employers trying to direct their health care services. Thank you. Well, State Senator, the fact is, is most voters will cast their ballot consistent with their party ID. Uh, there is, however, a growing population of independent voters. Why should an independent voter vote for you? The, the, the platforms that I have spoken to throughout this campaign in terms of strengthening public education, creating meaningful and living wage jobs through investment in our infrastructure. Uh, those are things that resonate, I believe, not only with Democrats, but with Republicans and certainly with independents. But the third area of this campaign, which talks about protecting civil liberties, protecting civic freedoms, that, I think, is the area that resonates with independence because, in a sense, independents have given up on both parties because of the party's positions on things that impact them individually. I think, in addition to independents, we have a lot of libertarians who are concerned about this overreach of government, where government is spying on us on our daily lives in a, in a daily way, where we are incarcerating for profit people who have been caught or, or convicted of possession of nonviolent substances, for women's rights to choose to make decisions about their own reproductive health care are challenged and constricted, and even to the point of limiting women's rights to contraception. I think those are the aspects of my campaign that resonate with people who are outside of either party, but who want to see a change, who want to hear a voice that will speak differently and that will speak truth to power. Well, Congressman, why should an independent voter vote for you? I would actually reach out to Republicans, independents, and Democrats. Uh, we're one state. There's four million of us. We do not all agree. Not all Republicans agree about everything. Not all Democrats agree about everything. Not all independents. Uh, I have four members of my family. We struggled to actually pick a restaurant after church on Sunday and try to find agreement among the four of us. We don't all agree on every issue. But we can get a chance to respect each other as we talk through the process. So what I would bring to an independent is this. I do have a very conservative perspective. I do believe in the Constitution. I believe that system actually helps us. 
I believe the economy really can grow if government is less engaged in the day-to-day -day operation of the economy. And we can get back to the growth of individual lives and their families and allow people to be able to live their lives on their own and make their own choices. But I would also say one of the things that I meet a lot of uh, independents that they're very frustrated with is the rhetoric. They want to see people actually treat each other with, re with respect. My Christian worldview that I come from and working with families for so many years, I'm going to pe tre treat people with respect, people that I disagree with. And there will be people that I disagree with, but also want to be able to listen to people, all people, of all backgrounds, and be able to hear it out. George Will makes a great statement that I've always appreciated. George Will makes the comment, truth is not responsible for its owner. I think it's pretty wise to be able to listen to that. That there are people that I may disagree with on other issues, but I'll agree with them on that one. So it, it demands that you actually slow down and be able to listen to people in the process and get to know folks. And it also demands that I turn around and be able to say, this is what I think, and we have a reasonable conversation. Thank you. Well, Congressman, the debate on immigration is centered on beefing up border security. Is border security the solution to illegal immigration? No, it's much bigger than that, actually. Uh, I come from a couple different perspectives uh, on any of the immigration policy. One is I really do believe every person's created in the image of God and has value and worth. Every person should be treated with respect. So in your rhetoric that demeans individuals, regardless of where they're from, is out of bounds for me. The second thing, though, is I really do believe that there is a uh, responsibility that every person has to their own nation. I'm a citizen of this country. In this country, I have unique rights and responsibilities. In every other country, I'm a guest. That is the same for anyone else. Now, the conversation is about just build a fence, and that's going to fix it. Well, it, there are areas where we absolutely should have a fence and should have a strong fence. But down the Texas-Mexico border, the international border is actually the center of the Rio Grande River. You're not going to build a fence down the middle of the river. Neither are you going to advocate to Mexico that river and the boundaries around it. So how do you deal with this? Border security is essential. We should have good policing along our borders and to make sure north and south border and our maritime coast that we should make sure that we're watching being attentive to who's coming in. We absolutely should work with the governments of Mexico and the, and the other three countries, realizing that we have 11 million people here illegally. Ten and a half million of those folks are from four countries, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Well, if they're going to come in from Central America, they have to cross the Mexican border to do that, coming through Guatemala into Mexico. We should work with the country of Mexico to be able to patrol that border as well and enforcement. And we should have a policy that does allow individuals to be able to apply, to be able to come work for short periods of time in the United States with absolute standards on that and to make sure that that occurs. The only way that that happens is enforcement actually at the workplace. So multiple areas to be able to do enforcement to do it right. Thank you. State Senator Johnson. Thank you. I think when we're talking about immigration, and, and the congressman has pointed out that the majority of them are coming from areas south of America, uh, I think we have to also realize that we are all immigrants in America, apart from the indigenous people. We all came to America in one shape, form, or fashion. My people came over in the bottom of a, of a slave ship. And so the process for people coming into America is what I think we're needing to look at more so. When we establish a system that has checks and balances, if people want to come to work, that's fine. If people want to come and make America a new home, if they're willing to abide by the rules, to do the test, to, to become a citizen, and pay the money, frankly, uh, then we should be open because, again, we all came here from somewhere. I think our policies about immigration are in need of repair. I think the president has been proposing some solutions that Congress has yet to act on. As your next U.S. Senator, I will be open to all aspects of the issue of immigration. I will definitely be open to the things that I think ensure that people, again, who come here, who abide by the rules, who do what's necessary, and they begin paying taxes, and they actually contribute to society. America is a better place when we have diversity. The food that we get, the inventions that come our way, the technological advances that are coming to America, all of those things come about because we're inviting people into our space. Thank you. Well, it's time now to hear from Oklahoma State University students. A panel has reviewed the uh, questions that were submitted by students in the audience. And the first question comes from Kenneth Huang, who is a senior. And this question is to you, State Senator. Uh, do you support the policy of using drone strikes to kill suspected terrorists, including U.S. citizens? The policy of using drones 
is typical of America's foreign policy to date, and that is military solutions, basically what are religious conflicts around the world. The, I think the policies regarding the drones are under review. I don't agree with that use of that technology. I do understand that it's been useful in some settings, but I think there are other ways for us to resolve our differences. And the use of extreme measures like drones ought to be the very last consideration in our policies. Congressman? It's a difficult issue in a lot of ways because it's a wartime. We're at a status of war, and the use of those have been individuals that are directly connected to Al-Qaeda, typically. So it, it, this ongoing conversation that's happened for about the last 12 years, President Bush uh, used drones in some of the strikes. President Obama has accelerated that. But I asked the question, it would be interesting for you and I to be able to have the conversation maybe after this is over. Is there a difference between an F-16 launching a missile, between an Apache launching a Hellfire, or between a drone being able to launch something? And for some individuals, they'd say, yes, they don't like a drone. They, they want a pilot in the aircraft actually launching that, rather than the pilot being a 1,000 miles away in a safe, secure room. I would say, really, in a wartime experience, there is no difference. Now, when you deal with the issue of what happens if that's an American on the ground there? Well, Americans have rights that are different than other individuals. They have constitutional protections. But if an American commits a treasonous act and as, is at war with the United States with their own country, if there's any way to be able to capture that individual, they should stand for trial. If there's no way safely to be able to access that person and they are in a battlefield situation in preparation to be able to attack the country with the enemy, yes, we're justified. That's no different than a police officer standing on the street, an American citizen draws a gun and says, I'm about to shoot you for a police officer to be able to respond to that. Now, that may be difficult to be able to process, but the President of the United States has a very difficult responsibility. That is to protect America and to protect our country from all enemies, foreign and domestic. And though the President and I have disagreed on many of the issues, this is one that requires oversight, but is one area that I do not disagree with. We should protect America. Thank you. Well, Congressman, this next question comes from Kelsey Hall, who's a sophomore here at OSU. Where do you stand on the issue of religious liberty, particularly applied to the Islamic faith? Oh, thanks, Kelsey. I'm absolutely adamantly protective of religious liberty. It's one of the issues that I talk about often on the House floor. It's one of the issues I talk about openly to a lot of people. I've had a lot of folks, become, because I come from a ministry background, a lot of people will come to me and say, well, you really need to tone down your conversation about God because you're in a secular role. I always smile and say, look at Article 6 of the Constitution. Article 6 of the Constitution says there's no religious test for any officer of the United States. You don't have to have a certain faith or put your faith away to be able to serve the United States. That is the same for every single American. Every person that's in this room, you can have a faith, live your faith out, or choose to have no faith at all. Be Christian, be Jewish, be Islamic, be Buddhist, be Hindu, be Sikh, whatever you choose to be on that. This is the United States of America, and we're different. So we should protect the religious liberties of every individual, and I would stand up as an individual and say, regardless of your faith background, we do need to protect those rights. Now let me give you one caveat. There are some in the Islamic faith that cannot practice their faith apart from the government also being aligned with their faith. Literally, their faith drifts into Sharia law to say, for me to function, I have to also control the government. I have to control the community. Now, that's not all in, that are in Islamic faith, but there are some that that's the way they practice. We in the United States absolutely honor those that have religious faith, but you cannot be an individual that would try to undercut the United States government for the practice of your faith. The government exists to protect all faiths, not to allow you a vehicle to be able to take over a section of any part of the government. Thank you. State Senator. Thank you. This whole issue of, of religious liberty, I believe, is one that is very concerning to many voters. And it comes under that whole title of what does the government do and what does the government not do? What should the government do with regard to people's lives, their, li their liberty, their pursuit of happiness? I believe that religious liberty is essential and that for the government to try to interfere and determine uh, who is supposed to do what is, is an embarrassment. It is actually a slap in the face to people who choose to be different. So that in our, in our country, when we have a condition of, of religious liberty being questioned or being constrained, that is not the best possible situation for us. 
I believe that in, this, in these days and times, we have extremists in every faith. Uh, those of us who would uh, only adhere to the Old Testament in the, in the Christian faith versus being under grace in the New Testament, uh, sometimes we can be just as uh, uh, rigid in our views uh, to the extent that we are infringing on those, uh, those territories similar to what other extremist religions might be doing. So religious liberty is a personal issue. It is an issue that the government should not be addressing. It is an issue that the United States was founded on. We came here seeking religious freedom. And for us to change down and try to constrict one, one way or the other, another is unacceptable in my opinion. Thank you. Well, State Senator, this question comes from Derek Wiedelman, who's a, a junior here at OSU. Which of the Senate committees do you feel that you are most qualified to serve on? Thank you, Derek. Um, these OSU students are deep thinkers. I appreciate that. I've got a daughter who just graduated from here. I have served uh, significantly in the area of health and human services, in fact, for the last 33 years. Uh, I've been in the area when we've reformed Medicaid, when we've reformed uh, the health care authority in the, in the state of Oklahoma. But I've also focused on criminal justice reform. How do we reform our criminal justice laws in ways that are, are productive and that don't cost us a lot of money? I've enjoyed serving on the Veterans Committee. I really got a big lesson when I served on the Transportation Committee because I know that roads and bridges are the key to, discuss, to recovery for our society in terms of economic uh, principles. So I think, I know I would like to stay in Health and Human Services, but I have a heart for the veterans. I have a, a, an economic interest in transportation. Uh, I've enjoyed serving on energy. I would be available to serve wherever I'm best suited to serve, wherever my leader thinks I should serve. I would serve in that position, do my best, and then as I gain seniority, I would branch out into other areas that continue to expand my expertise in order to better help citizens of the state of Oklahoma. Thank you. Congressman? Derek, Derek, I currently serve on the uh, Committee called Oversight and Government Reform in the House of Representatives. I'm a subcommittee chairman on that and I have oversight for energy policy, health care, and entitlements. I work a tremendous amount of things like social security disability, but also work a lot on the issues of oversight of government. That's duplication in government. Uh, that's an area of inefficiency. And I know this may be a shock to you, but at times the federal government can be fairly inefficient. Shocking, I know. The committee that has the greatest jurisdiction on that in the Senate is called Homeland Security Government Accountability. That committee itself allows me to be able to step in and to continue the work that I've already done in the last four years in the House of Representatives. How do we do greater oversight? Oversight is not a Republican-Democrat issue. Bureaucracy is bureaucracy. It doesn't matter who is in the White House at that point. You deal with duplication in government. One of the bills that I currently have that we passed in the House of Representatives is called the Taxpayer's Right to Know. It forces every agency to literally list every program that they do, how much they spend on that program, how many staff they have assigned to that program, and how they evaluate that program, if they evaluate it at all. That's passed the House of Representatives overwhelmingly bipartisan. I'd like to take that over to the Senate and try to get that passed in the Senate. That's one of the things that I could actually implement on that Homeland Security Government Accountability so that we can ask the agencies, or require the agency, I should say, to be able to provide that list and to be able to look for the areas where we have duplication. Why do we need 50 programs across 10 different agencies that do the same thing? We don't have money to spare. If you haven't noticed, we're over $17 trillion in debt, which is the big issue we face. We've got to get our government back to greater efficiency. Thank you. And that'll have to be our last question. Uh, it's time now for closing remarks. Once again, based on the coin toss, Congressman, you have two minutes. Thanks for the conversation, y'all. Glad you're all able to be here. For those that uh, endured to the end, online as well. I appreciate the conversation for your engagement to be able to stay involved. It's extremely important that people don't make decisions based on a sign or a sticker, that people make decisions based on real insight. And so I appreciate that y'all are engaging to be able to do the research and to be able to walk through the process to be able to make decisions on that. I would ask you if you'd like to do additional research on me and my background, what I think about a lot of issues, you can go to jameslankford.com, just jameslankford.com, and you get a chance to do greater research and be able to find out what I believe and what I'm all about. This is an issue about trust. As you said earlier, this is a long job interview. I've actually said that a lot as I travel around the state. I don't come from a political background. So for me, I really do treat this like a job interview. 
I go to people and say, here's what I believe and here's what I'm all about. I, I don't run down other candidates. I don't try to do compare contrast stuff. I say, here's who I am. And people can make a decision about who they want to be able to hire in this role. But I would ask for your vote in that process in your truck. I can't tell you my family and I work and pray very hard for our nation. And we do stay engaged. We're committed to serving all four million Oklahomans in every community, in every town, in every city, in every small rural village. We're going to stay engaged and trying to listen. But I can also say to you, even when I listen and do my research, at the end, I have the responsibility to be able to make a decision. The issues we face right now in America are serious. And they are difficult. Anyone who comes to you and says, we can fix all this if we will just, and then they fill in the blanks, is oversimplifying some of the issues we deal with as a nation. This year, we have $500 billion in overspending. Now, four years ago, when I came to the House of Representatives and joined the Budget Committee, we were $1.4 trillion in overspending that year. So through the budget fights of the last four years, we were able to get it down to $500 billion. We have many difficult issues to go. We have to balance, and we have to deal with the issues of everyday Americans and of Oklahomans. I will listen. I will research. And at the end, I will lead to be able to make the decision to be able to help us in the nation. God bless you. Look forward to our ongoing conversation the next 28 days. Thank you. State Senator, you have two minutes. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here this evening and to share in these conversations about the issues that most affect us as people. We've talked about veterans. We've talked about immigration. We've talked about defense and health care and social security. And as you think about those issues, I encourage you to ask the questions, what have you done for me lately? What have we done to make a difference in the lives of you and you and you versus the lives of the special interests who seem to take over our government right now? As your next U.S. Senator, I commit to you to always be a voice but to always be an ear that will listen to what is, what is of interest to you. What are the challenges that are facing you in your life? I've always been an, an advocate of voting, and I challenge you tonight to believe that this election is the most important election that we will have in the next 10 years. This is the election that they don't think anyone will vote in. I'm encouraging everyone, go out, use your vote, make your vote your voice. That is the only way we get to a government that really meets the needs of individuals versus the needs of the few. As your next U.S. Senator, it will be my privilege and my honor to represent you in the areas that matter most, like education, strengthening our health, our public education schools and systems. I like creating jobs that are meaningful jobs that pay a living wage, but mostly doing things, making government do the things that government is supposed to do for us as people and not in our lives as individuals. Those are the challenges, those are the opportunities that lie before us today. I want to say thank you again for having us here. I want to thank my family and my supporters who are here with me this evening. This has been a privilege. I appreciate you. God bless you. And vote for me. 2014, November 4th. You can visit me and get more information at www.cjbnumeral4ok.com. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes the debate. I would like to thank State Senator Connie Johnson and U.S. Representative James Langford for a very informative and also a very cordial debate. I also would like to thank the student uh, volunteers who helped uh, with the event today, as well as recognize the partnership between the League of Women Voters of Oklahoma and Oklahoma State University. Be sure to vote on November 4th. Have a good night. <laughs>